A broken heart is one of the most painful things a person can endure. CBS's Steve Hartman goes on the road and finds it's never too late when love is meant to be. For most of her adult life, 69-year-old Jean Gustafson has suffered from chronic regret. Can't turn back the clock. I wish I could. Would you do anything different? Yes, I would have married him. I would have married him. As we first reported a few months ago, what Jean so regrets is breaking up with her college sweetheart. So this was the spring of 72. A guy she met in the German club at Loyola University in Chicago. This is Steve and I in the back here. Jean says he would have made the perfect husband. A lot of memories here. If only he'd been white. My mother was absolutely livid. I mean, what did she say? What didn't she say? How could I disgrace the family? It was not pretty. Partly because of those pressures, Jean broke up with Steve Watts and never saw him again. Until last year, when she tracked him down at this Chicago nursing home. What I found was sort of a broken man. Like Jean, Steve was divorced with no kids. But life for him had been much harder. He'd fallen on terrible times. He was homeless, had two strokes, and was almost unrecognizable the day Jean walked back into his life. But he's still the wonderful, gorgeous man that I knew. Did all those feelings come rushing back? Yes, for both of us. And so, with her mother no longer in the way, Jean made arrangements to move Steve from the nursing home to her home in Portland, Oregon. Sleeping. I feel terribly lucky that I get a second chance. Steve? Steve's health issues have left him bedridden, but his mind is sharp and his heart young. In fact, if you listen closely, you can still hear his devotion, unwavering after all these years. I always love to. Racism drove its wedge, and love wormed its way back permanently. A few weeks ago, 43 years after her mom laid their love asunder, Jean and Steve were married, newlyweds, now well on their way to making up for a lifetime of lost time. Steve Hartman, CBS News, on the road. In six days, we will mark one year since the COVID outbreak was declared a pandemic. But as the world was shutting down, something special was blooming. Here's CBS's Steve Hartman on the road. This has been the worst year for dating bar None. Movie, none. And restaurants with all the ambiance of a parking meter. But here, along the banks of the Hudson River in upstate New York, we found a couple of singles who are making it work despite the pandemic. Wait a minute, get your glasses up. And that awkward eyewear. That's it for the week. John Schultz. He's a lot of baloney. And his girlfriend, Joy Morrow Knowlton, are both 94 each widowed twice, and each determined to find love yet again. They're now vaccinated, but had to be in a bubble most of the year. Did you ever think it was just too hard? <laughs> no. <laughs> she was worth it. It was a pain in the neck, though. <laughs> Perseverance. Pete Schultz is John's son. They would call every day. Um, they'd find a way to get together, but they did whatever it took. You haven't held hands with me all day, by the way. Hold my hand. What it took, they say, was a return to simple pleasures, like long drives to nowhere, batting balloons around the house, and a whole lot of selflessness. She bought me a walker. She bought you a walker? $159, I think. Whoa. I told you she had money. <laughs> she did have it, so she bought my walker. <laughs> Not to be outdone, John bought her a little something, too. Although he had to pop the question way more than once. Oh, dozens. Dozens? dozens? Finally I said okay. Wait, wait, what made you finally say yes? When we had snow days this year and I didn't come up here, I missed him. Um, bum, bum, bum. This week, bum, John and Joy held a rehearsal for their spring bum, wedding. Bum, 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 bum. It'll be the silk purse bum, bum, bum. at the end of this sow's year. <laughs> All possible because these romantics realized early on that a good date is nothing more than good 
company. There's some ice flows right out in the middle there. Steve Hartman. In fact, there's a whole line of them. On the road in Kingston, New York. And there's nothing better than finding your special someone. Finally tonight, how do you fight the hate and violence we witnessed at the Orlando nightclub? Steve Hartman may have found an answer on the road. At the University of Montevallo in Alabama, sophomore music major Jesse Johnson was devastated. Like my heart sank inside of my chest. After the Orlando attack, he says he wanted to mourn, but couldn't at least not with the sincerity he wanted to. In the back of my mind, I kept thinking, you know, I can't show the sorrow that I have inside without first explaining to the world why I have that much sorrow. So after hearing the news, Jesse sat down with his phone and did the most daring thing of his life. He typed out a message for his Facebook page, stared at it for the longest time, before finally mustering up the courage to click post. I just did it. The note read in part, I've thought about coming out for months, but was afraid of being shunned by those I care about over something that makes me who I am. I'm not going to change. I am gay, and I love you all. I wanted to officially be a part of that community that was hurting and that needed as many people to come together and stand with them. A lot of people came out after Orlando, but few took as big a risk as Jesse Johnson. Jesse's family lives in Jemison, Alabama, in the heart of the Bible Belt. Fly a flag here, and it better have just red, white, and blue. I worry for his safety because of that. I mean, this is Alabama. Jesse's mom, Nikki Johnson. I personally will never understand the parents that turn their back on their kids. I, I love him, and that'll never change. Love me too. When someone shoots up a gay bar, that kind of acceptance is not what he's aiming for. But Jesse says the majority of his family and friends have been remarkably supportive. And by doing so, they have helped turn his lifetime of fear into his future of belonging. We're gonna to stand together regardless of how afraid we are. And that's how you make a terrorist die in vain. Steve Hartman on the road in Montevallo, Alabama. In any marriage, there are challenges. You just don't expect them in the very first hour. Here's CBS's Steve Hartman on the road. Bride and groom Elizabeth and Jake Landit say their wedding was like a fairy tale. Was. The ceremony was perfect. You may kiss your bride. Everything we could have dreamed of until. So my dad was doing his father of the bride speech and just a minute in, he was interrupted by some of our guests. Hose on fire. And that was the end of that. The cottage right next to their wedding venue on Mackinac Island, Michigan caught fire and everyone had to evacuate the area. This is a picture of the newly fleds abandoning their reception. I didn't know where we were going. I just figured we had to walk away from that. So we just started heading towards the church the church where they'd just been married. This time, they prayed for everyone's safety. And in the end, no one was hurt, and even the building was saved. Seemed like the only thing that couldn't be salvaged was their wedding day. But unbeknownst to the bride and groom, while they were in that church praying, angels were swooping in from all over town. We needed to step up and do the right thing. First, the chef at the venue took all 120 meals, which were only partially prepared, okay. and instructed his staff to get them out. We just ran with it. Ran those meals to the restaurant next door. We just cooked it, sauced it, and off down the street it went. Down the street to a resort that had an event space available. Everyone offered how could they help, and we started just pulling everything that we had. And what they didn't have? yet another restaurant provided. So we got it all on a card and pushed it down Main Street. That's the other thing. It's gonna be great. Mackinac Island doesn't have cars, so this whole migration was done manually, powered by sheer will and the kindness of strangers, Hello. like the bellhop who volunteered to be a bartender. And because of everyone's efforts, in less than an hour, the bride was back to blushing. And what did you charge for this help? Um, nothing. I didn't charge him anything. Nothing? No. To have them 
pick up a reception like, out of ashes in a very literal sense made the wedding better than we ever could have imagined. And, and one that well, we don't necessarily recommend. <laughs> it's a day and an experience that we'll cherish forever. A perfect wedding after all. Steve Hartman on the road on Mackinac Island, Michigan. We end tonight with a man who has so much love, he had to build a special place to keep it all. Steve Hartman met him on the road. Around Starkville, Mississippi, retired mail carrier Charles Evans is known mostly for his questionable taste in lawn furnishings. But we came last year for something undeniably beautiful. The man with the plan. <laughs> Charles met his wife Louise back in 1949. When you looked at her, it's like, <coughs> whoa, like electrical shock. Really? I guess it's love. To Charles, <laughs> true love is so powerful, nothing can stop it. That's a big four-letter word. Nothing. Straighten it out. Which is why, after she died in 2011, after 60 years of marriage, he decided a grave marker wasn't enough, that their love deserved more than a monument. What their love needed was a museum. And so, in a little outbuilding behind his house, Charles Evans built just that. This is our memorabilia area. Inside, he's got the shoe shine stand he was working at when he met her. He's got all the music they used to dance to. And he's got four walls packed solid with pictures, documenting every significant occasion. And this was we went out to lunch. And most every insignificant occasion. This was a different place at lunch. <laughs> different lunch. And this, she didn't like that one because they called her laughing with food in her mouth. <laughs> Needless to say, he wasn't getting a whole lot of visitors, which was fine and by that, Charles. This is our last dance. In fact, we got the sense he almost enjoyed his alone time more. On slow days, he would slow dance with Louise. I guess I'm trying to relive our life, would you think? <laughs> Maybe. I, I don't know. I, it's, it's so hard to explain, you know. But it's not a suffering memory, it's a beautiful memory, you know. Fortunately, a lot of our viewers could relate. Since that story first aired, 250 people from as far away as India have come to see the museum. Some even go for a spin with the curator. <laughs> of course, none of these new dance partners can hold a candle to his Louise. But Charles says he's still happy that people are getting the message of his museum. Us again. That love can never be lost, as long as it's savored. Yeah, she was lovely. Steve Hartman, on the road, in Starkville, Mississippi. <laughs> Charles Evans keeping that love electricity alive. Hopeless romantic that he is, Steve Hartman went looking for a Valentine story. He found a gem on the road to the emergency room. At St. Clair's Hospital in Denville, New Jersey, they still can't stop talking about it. You don't forget any call like that. A few months ago, these emergency responders got a call for a man with chest pain. And what a heart they found. First thing he said was, don't let me die. He said that to me too. He said all he wanted to do was take his wife out to Ruth Chris for dinner. Her favorite restaurant. It's pretty cute. Those were the final words of 91-year-old Joe Lefkin his last wish before suffering a major heart attack was to take his wife to dinner one last time. It seemed as though he loved her a great deal. His wife, Margie, can't tell you how hard it is to lose the love of your life. Can't tell you because her husband's death was short-lived. Oh, you're making me lunch, honey? Yes, darling. Joe was gone just 10 minutes before medics restarted his heart. And what amazed them was what he woke up shouting. He said, Ruth Chris. You know, he's coming mean, back from the dead. He's saying the same thing. Exactly. He said exactly the same thing. Joe got his dinner with Margie. On the house, of course. But they say the greater gift is still giving. We're just closer. If that's, po if that's possible, is this true, Boom? Oh, yeah. She's one in a million, Steve. <laughs> I can still make her swoon. You want to see it? Yeah. Well, no, no, I take that back. Okay. <laughs> meant no when I said yeah. Are we too much? Is you too much? Yeah. <laughs> this weekend, 
couples across America will go out, assuming there will be many more Valentines to come. Here's something else. But not Joe and Margie. <laughs> they will go to dinner, appreciating each other now more than ever. Steve, she's got six men. No, that don't, don't say that. Don't say that. Please I, don't say that. You're on the air. And they're all waiting for me to check out. You shouldn't say that. You've got that. so many guys that well, love you. You're on the air. Well, he's going to cut this all out. Please, I hope so. You got to love. I'm going to feel the way I do. Young love. Today, because you make me feel so young. <laughs> yep. Steve Hartman on the road in Denville, New Jersey. <laughs> How does Steve find these stories? That's the CBS Evening News for tonight. For all of us at CBS News all around the world, I'm Scott Pelley, and I'll see you Sunday on 60 Minutes. Good night. There's really not a whole lot to do at Lakeside Park in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. At least, not in the winter. So why then? For the past couple months, have these two city workers been sneaking off on their own to shovel a walkway no one really needs to walk on? For most people, it's a path to nowhere. Yeah, it's a path to somewhere for one person. Jared Ebert and Kevin Schultz say they discovered that one person one snowy day. He was in his car. He was in his car and the snowbank was there. <laughs> Did you know what he was doing there? Kind, kind of put it together. It took us both back a little bit thinking, my gosh, his devotion is that strong that he still comes when he can't make it to the bench even. At the end of the walk, there's a bench dedicated to a woman named Betty Caldwell. And just based on the flowers, you can tell, she still loved. I'll give you a daisy a day, dear. I'll give you a daisy a day. Bud Caldwell says his wife loved that song, Daisy a Day. And the four winds we know blow away. So when he lost her a couple years ago, after 55 years of marriage, he got a bench in her memory and started taking her daisies every day he could. He thought no one was noticing. So imagine his surprise. Yeah, one day I pulled up there and there's the walk shoveled. What'd you think of that? My knees about buckled on me. Bud couldn't believe someone would go to such trouble. Totally unexpected, you know. We're just doing what we felt was our job. I haven't read your job description, but I don't think it's in there. <laughs> Some intuition, be it divine or otherwise, says, you know, this is why you're here, to help one another. Good afternoon, dear. Well, it's a nice day. Cold, but nice. Here's your daisy. Sometimes, to make a difference in the world, you need a good idea. And sometimes, all you need is to recognize the good around you and clear the way for it. See you tomorrow, Munchkin. Love you. Always did. Always will. I'll give you a daisy a day, dear. I'll give you a daisy a day. I'll love you until all the rivers run still. And the four winds we know blow away. Steve Hartman, on the road, in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. Finally tonight, doctors can give you a new heart, but who puts the love in? Turns out it's already there, waiting to be discovered. Here's Steve Hartman, on the road. In Rochester, New York, at the University of Rochester Strong Memorial Hospital, two heart transplant patients are shedding new light on the healing process. After they got their new hearts, 68-year-old Esther Fitzrandolph and 68-year-old Danny Shokowski both suffered from complications and depression. They'd all but given up. Uh, I, I didn't want to do anything. I would just sit around. I kind of refused the exercises and all that at times. But a few months ago, Simultaneously, both these patients started really improving. Sounds great. Cardiologist Dr. Li Wei Chen and the rest of the staff here were pleasantly confounded. We talked and said, yeah, she's doing better now. I wonder why. And yeah, he's been more, more active and, and involved in his care. I wonder why. You knew why you were getting better. Yes, yes. You were on something. Yes. Same thing she was on. I wanted to do more things. I wanted to walk. I wanted to ride a bike. So what was this miracle drug? What had they found that so dramatically accelerated their recoveries? Just each other. 
After their surgeries, Danny and Esther kept running into each other at follow-up appointments. And although she was twice divorced and not looking for another man, and he was a committed lifelong bachelor, they started dating and healing. When your mind is in a better place and your heart, <laughs> then you're going to heal better. Dr. Chen says that's true. You know, we're not talking about science anymore. Not science that we can put our finger on. He says there have been plenty of studies linking love and support <laughs> to health and heart. This is just further proof. And as for the happy couple, they're now enjoying life on Carefree Lane. Seriously, they moved in together on Carefree Lane. The lifelong bachelor now has flowered coffee mugs. Yeah, I'm this gonna... is even worse. <laughs> Living with a woman will clearly take some getting used to. Honey, it's worse. It's not worst. But of course, every medicine has its side effects. And they say it's well worth it. I recommend it to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> to survive, Danny and Esther both needed new hearts. But to truly live, they needed sweethearts, too. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Rochester, New York. Here's hoping you're carefree. We end tonight with an update on a story we brought you a while back about a couple of old souls with brand new hearts. It appears those hearts are working just fine because they just got hitched. Here's Steve Hartman on the road. When Danny Shulkowski and his sweetheart Esther Fitzrandolph walked down the aisle last weekend, they did so in the usual way, but in a most unusual place, a hospital chapel. In sickness and in health. Just seemed like the obvious place to be married. In sickness and in health. When our love started here. As we first reported a couple months ago, <laughs> Esther, who was divorced, and Danny, a lifelong bachelor, met at the University of Rochester's Strong Memorial Hospital in Rochester, New York. They were both here for follow-up appointments after their heart transplant surgeries. They were both having complications, and they were both depressed. Ah. <sighs> I, I didn't want to do anything. I would just sit around. I kind of refused the exercises and all that at times. But after they started dating, they started improving. So quickly, their doctors couldn't believe it. Sounds great. Cardiologist Dr. Li Wei Chen says he and his staff didn't know about the romance. We talked and said, yeah, she's doing better now. I, I wonder why. And yeah, he's been more, more active and, and involved in his care. I wonder why. Today. Dr. Chen gives full credit to the healing power of love. When your mind is in a better place and your heart, <laughs> then you're going to heal better. For the last few months, they've been living together on Carefree Lane. That's actually the name of the street, where this lifelong bachelor now hangs his new flowered coffee mugs. Yeah, this this is even worse. <laughs> living with a woman will clearly take some getting used to. Honey, it's worse. It's not worst. But Danny says he wouldn't trade this for the world, and he won't have to, thanks to two new hearts that are now off and racing. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Rochester, New York. It's 12 days till Christmas, and Steve Hartman found a place that's busier than Santa's workshop. But there are no elves in sight. Here's tonight's On the Road. For Charlie and Dorothy Hale of Rochester, New York, every day is like Christmas morning. Ooh. Bright, shiny woodwinds and worn out old brass. Brown cardboard packages tied up with strings. Used musical instruments are their favorite things. This just came from FedEx. They show up all day without intermission. That's a big one. And each piece in some yeah. form of disrepair. Oops, I told you it had some problems. They started out buying these broken instruments a few years ago after Dorothy took a class in instrument repair. I always loved to take things apart. And it's about time I learned how to put something together. <laughs> I put shellac on that. Dorothy, a retired chemist, and Charlie, a retired doctor, are both now in their 80s but still very active in this passion, to restore musical instruments to their former glory, and then give them away by the hundreds. So far, the Hales have donated nearly a thousand instruments to the Rochester School District. 
Allison Schmidt is the lead teacher for the arts department. Can everybody play an instrument here who wants to? Absolutely. It's unbelievable for two humans to care so much about other people's children. Allison says the impact has been huge, but it was interesting. When I tried to talk to the Hales about this, they seem downright oblivious. I have no doubt you've changed lives. And that to me is the, you don't think so? No, I don't. There are ripples of effect, I hope, you know. Ripples? Sophomore William Delgado says it's more like tidal waves. Really music has and can create somebody. And he created me. Studies consistently show that music education helps kids do better in school overall. If for no other reason than it makes them want to attend. I wish you could be there every time I get to hand an instrument to a student and their eyes light up. Fortunately, the Hales are now starting to understand. If I could thank you every single day of my life, I would. As we go into the holidays, it's good to remember that there is no greater gift than simply telling someone just how important they really are. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Rochester, New York. Let's send them more instruments. We end tonight with a trip to the altar for an I do-over. Here's Steve Hartman on the road. Which pictures do we have here? Anything current? Jeff and Angela are in that getting to know you stage of their relationship. But unlike most couples going through this discovery period. Oh, remember that. Jeff and Angela Hartung of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yep. What did we do when we were there? Are married and have been for the past 17 years. I don't remember. So much was lost after the accident. About five years ago, Angela got hit by a car while crossing this intersection in New York City. She suffered a traumatic brain injury and was in a coma for about a month. When she woke up, she was trapped in the past. I don't remember anything at all. I asked for my two children. I thought they were like two and eight years old. They were 17 and 23 years old. Two. You're sweet. Angela had no memory of at least the last 15 years of her life. She thought she was still married to her first husband, who died long ago, and had no recollection whatsoever of her second wedding to Jeff, or anything about Jeff, which left him with a question that had no easy answer. How to go from stranger back to spouse? He started by lining virtually every inch of their home with pictures, reminders of happier days. Then mm -hmm. he began and, uh, courting his wife. What about that one up there? And most importantly, well, more he never left your... her side. I love how you've helped me. And eventually, it worked, which called for a celebration, one Angela would never forget. We're gathered here today as witnesses for Jeff and Angela as they renew their vows of holy matrimony. Earlier this month, surrounded by friends and family in New York's Central Park, Jeff and Angela started the next chapter of their Today, storybook tale. Today, I choose you, Angela. Again. Again. Now kiss your bride, Jeff. <laughs> of course, those painful years would have broken a lot of marriages. But Jeff believes the accident did quite the opposite for his. I honestly believe that this happened for a reason. You feel like it's a blessing that this happened, not the injuries, mm. but the fact that you had to prove yourself all over again? I do, to be able to do over. How many times have we said, oh, I wish I could go back and do something over again? I've gotten to do that. And that's the beauty of having a second chance at finding your one true love. Steve Hartman, on the road in New York. We're heading into a weekend that is about remembering. So we end tonight with one man's battle to do just that. Steve Hartman met him on the road. Remembering 60 years back is hard for anyone, but for Melvin Amrine, the groom in these pictures, it's especially challenging. Did I invite you to marry me or did you ask me? No, no, you asked me to no, marry oh, you. Oh, is that right? Melvin was diagnosed with Alzheimer's three years ago. Some of that is kind of lost. For his wife, Doris, it's been hard to watch. 
but she says something happened recently to remind her that the man she fell in love with is still in there. It's special because even though the mind doesn't remember everything, the heart remembers. Okay. It happened the day before Mother's Day when Melvin, who normally needs help just walking around the block, turned up missing. I see a white male by the name of Melvin Amrine. Police dispatch here in Little Rock, Arkansas, put out the call. He left the house walking approximately 40 minutes ago. They eventually found him two miles from his house. Police say they get these calls every once in a while of an Alzheimer's patient out wandering aimlessly. But this one was different. When the officers approached Melvin, they say it was clear. He was a man on a mission. It was absolutely a moment of clarity for him. Sergeant Brian Grigsby and Officer Troy Dillard say even though Melvin didn't know his address or where he'd come from, he absolutely knew where he was going. I mean, he, he was pretty adamant. He wasn't going home until he got those flowers. Flowers? That's what he wanted. He wanted flowers for his wife because uh, tomorrow was Mother's Day. Melvin had bought flowers for his wife every Mother's Day since the birth of their first child. And he wasn't going to disappoint her now. We had to get those flowers. We had to get them. <laughs> I didn't have a choice. So after telling dispatch, they were taking the man right home. And there's the Kroger's. The officers secretly stopped by the grocery store. Surveillance video shows them helping Melvin pick out the flowers. And when Melvin came up short at the register, look who slipped the cashier the difference. Meanwhile, back at home, a very worried wife was about to get the gift of a lifetime. As he came up those steps, and I saw those roses and the smile on his face, I mean, I just broke inside. I just said, thank you, thank you, because I saw his heart. Amazing what's possible when love becomes an instinct. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Little Rock. Steve Hartman found a story of love in the time of COVID-19. Here's tonight's On the Road. Turns out social distancing, staying at home, even locking yourself in your apartment cannot prevent love sickness. Take the case of 28-year-old Jeremy Cohen, the Brooklyn man who fell for a girl he saw out his window dancing on her roof. What did you see in her? You could barely see her. I saw a shining bright light. I mean, she was, she was happiness in a dark time. So I went out to my deck and I waved hi. She waved hi back. I felt a little bit of a connection. But there's nothing you can do about it. Unless. Unless you have a drone and the courage to fly your phone number to a total stranger. 23-year-old Tori Signorella texted Jeremy shortly after. So I asked her out to dinner. Of course, Tori couldn't come over, so she sat at her table and he at his. You look beautiful! They even shared a FaceTime toast. It felt like a real like date, like even though we were on FaceTime. And the date lasted until Tori's phone died. <laughs> until her phone died. <laughs> yeah. For their second date, this week the couple went for a walk using a giant bubble Jeremy bought on eBay. Tori was bowled over by the gesture, almost literally. <laughs> Perhaps next, Jeremy can fly his toothbrush over to her place. I mean, why not? She's already met his mother. Your mom reached out. No. <laughs> She's so nice. Why wouldn't she tell me? So are you guys dating now? Sure, but we're open to seeing other roof people right now. <laughs> it is hard to maintain a long distance relationship, even if it's just across the street. But we will certainly be rooting for them because it's their kind of attitude and ingenuity that we're going to need to preserve our humanity. Steve Hartman on the road in New York. Okay, that's the second time I've teared up during this broadcast. This weekend's Grammy Awards are sure to include plenty of love songs, but none can top the one Steve Hartman found on the road. <laughs> I remember that. It's been 61 years of wedded bliss, but Mort and Susan Block of Kennett Square, Pennsylvania, say they're meant to be, almost never was. Right. Not because of Mort. He knew he wanted to marry her from day one. It was just like that. It was instant for me. But Susan, not so much. I didn't have any grandiose feeling that it was going to go anywhere. To complicate matters, Mort was a sailor. And after that first date, he headed out to sea, where, 
on the bridge of the destroyer Hazelwood, he wrote a song for Susan. And my feelings were, I miss you more each day since you've gone away. The song was called My Love, and it worked its magic. My love. And then it went in a drawer, and it stayed there. Enter my grandson. Then I was like, oh, what, what's that? Matt Block saw the sheet music and shared it with some friends. And everyone was like, damn, this is like, this is a hit. This is great. Matt works in the music industry, so he was able to gather some of the best studio musicians in the country. And together, they took that dusty old love song and made it sing. You never seem to know that I love you so. Mort's love song, originally intended for an audience of one, has now been played more than a million times on social media. I love I was floored. Running up and down the hall. It was unbelievable. And that is just the beginning. This fall, Mort Block, now 82, will grace the cover of an album featuring My Love and other collaborations. Perhaps a Grammy next year. But for Mort and Susan, like couples everywhere, Cheers. the song of the year will always be their song. Cheers. Through our joy and our tears, my love. Steve Hartman, on the road in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. For Valentine's Day, Steve Hartman's found a story that proves true love is eternal. So here's tonight's On the Road. This week, 45-year-old Corey Cunningham was rushed to Houston Methodist Hospital, the first patient ever brought here to have his bachelor status removed. Corey has an incurable brain tumor. He's on home hospice, but the good doctors and nurses at Houston Methodist brought him back to the chapel and arranged all this just so Corey could cross off the only thing on his bucket list, get married. Taisha Evans is his bride. That was the one thing he wanted to do before he died. <laughs> Taisha and Corey dated seven years, and although he knew he wanted to marry her from the moment they met, she turned down his proposal nearly a dozen times. Because his job was more important. Corey worked in oil and gas, traveled the world, and made good money. Money was everything to Corey. But not to her. Hi, Taisha. Taisha always said she would never marry a guy who was never around. And my husband. So what changed? Having to hold? It's not what you think. Taisha says pity played no part in her change of heart. She says Corey still had to prove he was the man of her dreams. Fortunately, one of the few blessings of a terminal illness is to understand what true love takes. Everything about him is just completely different. When you walk in the room, you could feel it. The first step in his transformation, acknowledging he'd been a fool. Yes, because I could have been spending more time with her. The second step, making up for all that lost time. Was it a sense of relief when you finally Got married? <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> I feel like I'm lucky to man alive. This Valentine's weekend, a lot of guys and girls will celebrate with fine food and even finer jewelry, but not these newlyweds. From this day forward, for worse, for poor, and in sickness, Corey and Taisha will honor the harshest demands of their wedding vows because they know those are the only parts of the promise that guarantee you a happily ever after. Steve Hartman, on the road in Houston, Texas. To love and to cherish as the vows go. We end the week with a story about the power of love. Here's Steve Hartman on the road. Thank you all for coming to this special occasion. Deep in New York's Adirondack Mountains, friends and family gathered to help 59-year-old Chris Sharoon DeForge pay tribute to her remarkable husband. Your marriage to Paul was one for the history books. What did you love about him? Yeah, his sense of humor. He got me laughing and everything. <laughs> he was the one for me. That's him? 
That's me and my Polly. Chris and Paul met in 1988. And after dating five years, they became one of the first couples in the world with Down syndrome to get married. I proposed to him. You proposed to him? Yes. I whispered in his ear, would you marry me? <laughs> and he looked up with me with his big, beautiful smile. He shook his head, yes. What's on the menu for tonight? But Chris's sister, Susan Sharoon, says it took a lot more than yes to get them to I do. There were marriage classes, counseling sessions, and a whole lot of pushback from supposedly able-minded people. Yeah, there really was quite a bit of resistance. There was a feeling that it was like children getting married versus two you know, very capable adults. Today, people with Down syndrome who want to get married still face resistance. There's still some question as to whether couples like Chris and Paul love as deeply as the rest of us. And in fact, we saw evidence that maybe they don't, that maybe their love is deeper. Thanks to you and Paul, everyone here has seen what true love looks like. At the end of the ceremony, beautiful. Chris spread a portion of her husband's ashes near the lake where he loved to fish. Yes, you love him so much. The rest will be mixed with hers one day. I love you. And buried together. I do the best I can. And you were the best wife any husband could ever have. It was an intensely intimate moment, shared with you today for a reason. What I hope is that other families will entertain this. You know, other people will recognize the importance of this kind of, you know, intimate love. People like us need to have a chance. Chance at what? A chance to find the man of your dreams like I did. Are you going to be able to be happy again? To be honest, I don't know. I just lost the man that I love. But I'm going to try. And even if she doesn't succeed, Chris says it's still far better to have loved and lost than to be told you can never love at all. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in New York's Adirondack Mountains. What a beautiful and barrier-breaking love story. No gift is more precious than the gift of life. One couple has given it twice to the same man. Here's CBS's Steve Hartman for tonight's On the Road. The vows say, till death do us part. But for Terry and Brian Harrington of Pensacola, Florida, death was just another chapter in a love story that carries on to this very day, 16 years after Brian died in a work accident. They lived together in me, so I'll try to keep them alive as long as I can. This is Jeff Granger. He received Brian's kidney. He also gained a friend. After the transplant, Jeff met Brian's widow, Terry, and her two small children. They all grew close, and all was great until last year, when the kidneys started failing. The first thing, you know, that crossed my mind was, golly, I'm going to tell Terry, you know, that Brian's kidney's failing. It was like, okay, well, that's another piece of Brian that has gone. Terry didn't want to lose her husband all over again, not to mention her new friend. So without hesitation, she offered her kidney to continue the life-saving mission her husband had started. By sheer coincidence, they were a match. Hey, and the operation here at University of Florida Health Shands Hospital was a success. Now the kidneys from both husband and wife lie side by side, together in purpose, all thanks to the silver lining that is organ donation. Seeing him going fishing and boating and just living life. It's just an amazing feeling that you're helping somebody. Jeff, how do you say thank you? I, I never could repay it. She needed it. I'd give her my right arm. I'd give her my right arm. If she didn't need it. <laughs> <laughs> and there's your living, laughing proof that a truly enduring love story has no final chapter. Steve Hartman, CBS News, on the road. Spring is a time of rebirth and renewal, but for one Connecticut community, it's also a time to remember a love story for the ages. Here's CBS's Steve Hartman on the road. For many, it's a mystery that blooms anew every spring. How many years has this been here? I don't know, a long time though. 
This field of daffodils, far too many to be growing by chance, far too beautiful to not stop and stroll, seems randomly set along a narrow two-lane road in southwestern Connecticut. When I drive by, it just brings tears to my eyes because that's how I remember them. To Patty Pavlik, this field is no mystery. Her aunt and uncle, Bud and Florence McQuaid, used to own the land. Patty says her uncle Bud planted these daffodils because Florence loved them so, and because he loved her so through 60 years of marriage. So every day was as happy as this day. I would surmise so. Mm -hmm. As testament. Yes, yes. <laughs> Today, there are roughly 40,000 flowers. That was his memory of her. After Florence died, dividing the bulbs to grow more became Bud's annual tribute and obsession. He lived to 103, planting daffodils almost to the very end. Bud passed in 2019, and his property went on the market. It's a prime building lot, so many thought that would be the end of it. You know, someone would build something on this, and this would become just someone's front lawn, and the flowers would be gone. But neighbor Stacy Steinmetz stepped in, buying the property and the metaphor that comes with it. I guess just like his love grew, the, the field continues to grow. You know, it's everlasting and it's expanding, so I certainly wouldn't want that to be lost. So it stays, an eternal sign of spring and brilliantly illustrated love story, documenting in vivid color for couples everywhere. It smells so good. It does. Just how endless love can be. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Redding, Connecticut. Kiss the girl in the playground. And that's a problem these days? Well, in your first grade. And it's a problem every day. What do you mean? It's always been a problem. But I hate to ruin the kid's spontaneity, though. Know? <laughs> yeah, shit. Not that kind. I think there were two girls. He kissed two girls in one day? Yeah. Did he see it on television? He didn't see it from Andrew and me. <laughs> thing still to this day in dating is leaning in for that first kiss. If you get a lean, oh, back, that lean back, oh man, you feel yeah. terrible. Yeah. And it will last for months. Yeah. But you, next time oh. you go in for a kiss, you're always thinking about yeah, this, that, that time lean back. It's one of the worst teenage moments you can have. Yeah. Or in George's case, first grade. <laughs> What better way to end the week than with a love story, starring a husband and wife and a song that means everything to them. Here's CBS's Steve Hartman on the road. Oh, okay. Hmm. Joe and Sharon Korst of Raleigh, North Carolina, just celebrated 63 years of wedded bliss. Wow. And to mark the milestone, Look at this one. Joe gave his bride one of the best anniversary presents ever. Of all the things that that he could have done, that was probably the most meaningful. I love you. To fully appreciate the gift, okay. you first need to hear the song. How beautiful you are. Their song. It's a Kenny Rogers tune called Beautiful, All That You Could Be. And for years, Joe sang it to Sharon on birthdays, anniversaries, and so many other occasions that eventually, Friends and family memorized it too. Teresa Castrava is their daughter. She is the number one thing in his life. Here's to you, Sharon. And singing that song was the way to say it. Teresa says it was the way to say it. Yeah, I get tired. Joe recently suffered two strokes. How do you spell up? Which left him at a terrible loss up. for language. I'm lost. <laughs> I have trouble calling my wife's name or the children's name and uh... So you lost the song? Yeah. So I just accepted it and didn't really think about it till this past anniversary. And, <laughs> and then he started singing it. Mostly unbeknownst to Sharon, Joe had been working hard to rescue their song. Whenever a line came back to him in the hospital, he jotted it down in a notebook. 
and listen to the melody on a loop. I wanted to relearn it and to give it to my wife. Just like he always did. It's all that you give me. And that's how the best anniversary present ever turned out to be the same anniversary present as always. Steve Hartman. I love you. CBS News. Thank you. On the road. Nearly a million visitors are pouring into the Big Easy this week and next. Most are coming the easy ways, on wings and wheels. But we found one guy doing it the hard way. There he is. The very hard way. See that little red dot? That's Dominic Liberon of Medicine Hat, Alberta. He started clean shaven eight months ago, put in on a little trickle in Canada called the Frenchman River, followed that down to the Milk River, to the Missouri, to the Mississippi, nearly 3,300 miles total, all in a canoe. They have planes in Canada, you know. <laughs> we, have, we have to get to them with dog slayers. Oh, do you? <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that. That I makes it could, tough. Okay. Yeah. He actually does have a legitimate reason, and it has nothing to do with football. In fact, when he started this trip, he didn't even know the Super Bowl was going to be in New Orleans. All he knew was that his favorite uncle, his uncle Mitch, loved this town. It's really hot and tight. This is Mitch, driving into the city on his one and only trip to New Orleans in 1992. He spent just a few days here, although, according to his nephew, he never really came back. In his head, he never came back? That's right, because when he returned to Canada, he had a bunch of Cajun recipes with him. He started his own Cajun uh, catering company. Mitch also started up a local radio show called Mardi Gras Mambo. Mardi Gras Mambo! All this in Saskatchewan, of all places. Growing up, Dominic heard so much about New Orleans from his uncle. He knew he had to get there someday. And when Mitch died a couple years ago of a heart attack, at just 42, Dominic realized you can't wait for someday. And so he began this epic journey. Dominic did it partly as a way to let off some grief, but mostly just to give his uncle one last great adventure. Tucked in the boat, safe and dry the whole way, a small vial of his uncle's ashes. Dominic's family met him at the dock. Let's thank my And then they all went to a quiet corner of New Orleans, held hands, and let go. All right, you're where you belong. This weekend, some men on a field are going to try to reach for greatness. But real greatness isn't always what you do in life. Real greatness is often best measured by the greatness you inspire in others. And by that standard, it's going to be hard to top Uncle Mitch. He was my hero. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in New Orleans. Finally tonight, in one of the most famous teachings about love, St. Paul wrote that love is patient, endures all things, and never loses hope. Steve Hartman found living proof on the road. I'll take another kiss. Maya Shand of Windsor, Connecticut can't keep her hands off her husband, Mark. She's constantly pinching and patting and preening the poor guy. Would you stop fixing my clothes? <laughs> if you didn't know better, you'd think they were newlyweds. But Mark and Maya have been together for years. What's different now is that they're finally actually together. Mm. We were just separated, that's it. Real long hiatus. Yeah. The story of their separation is so defining. Mark has every moment of it tattooed on his arm. 26 years, 11 months, four days, 20 hours, 26 minutes and eight seconds. And all of it for nothing. Here's what happened. In 1986, about a year after they met, Mark was arrested, convicted, and sentenced to life without parole for a murder we now know he didn't commit. Last fall, lawyers from the Innocence Project proved he had nothing to do with the crime. Three months later, the hugs still haven't stopped as Mark and Maya continue to celebrate not only his vindication, but her dedication. I never gave up, never. They got me for 27 years, but I got Maya. <laughs> Mark knows not many women would wait around like Maya did, especially considering they weren't even married when he was arrested. Maya, who works at a beauty parlor, says she knew he was innocent and she was pregnant with his child at the time. 
so she stayed with him. Drove five hours round trip every week to visit. Why didn't you tell her to just move on? I did. I said, I think you deserve better than this. This is not a normal life. It's not a normal setting. Didn't need to seek out nowhere else because my heart was where it was supposed to be. Once Mark realized Maya wasn't going anywhere, he proposed. They got married in the visiting room. Maya raised their son alone and helped raise his two other boys from previous relationships. The woman is clearly a saint. You know this guy owes you big time. Oh yeah, he does. <laughs> a double oven. A double oven, that's all you want out of the deal. So he knows I like to cook. That's all you need, huh? That's all I need. He's home, that's all I ever wanted. That's ever, all I ever wanted from him. This week, Mark, Maya, their three boys, and four grandchildren got together for their first family dinner of the new year. It was all smiles, until after the prayer, when Maya just broke down. Mark wanted to know what was wrong. Come here, what's the matter with you? But that was the thing. Maya, what's wrong? For the first time in 27 years, cry do that. absolutely nothing was wrong. There's many more to come to. Steve Hartman on the road in Windsor, Connecticut. Okay. You all right? Mm -hmm. One way or another, it had to end like this. Are you ready? One way or another, Larry Swilling knew his wife, Jimmy Sue, would eventually be hospitalized with a failing kidney. He knew he'd have tears. Only thing he didn't know was whether they'd be happy or sad. When we first met Larry a year ago, he was desperately trying to rewrite his wife's final chapter. I'm going to get you a kidney. Since she needed a kidney and he had no shame on the matter. I don't care what people think. Larry set out to find an organ donor on his own. I sure could use your kidney. Never mind that most people won't give panhandlers their pocket change, let alone their vital organs. I need a kidney. Larry, at the age of 77, started walking all over his hometown of Anderson, South Carolina, basically begging for a kidney. I had to do something. She looks after me, and I, I look after her. After 57 years of marriage, We've been together so long. their love is so palpable, it practically melts you in your seat. Which is probably why, after our first story aired, thousands of people called to offer their kidneys. There's a mighty bunch of good people out there who's wanting to help. More than 100 of that mighty bunch went through the testing to see if they were a match. And would you believe... Well, how are you doing? One was. Oh, my goodness. After a full year of searching, this week, Larry Swilling finally met his miracle. She's a 41-year-old retired Navy lieutenant commander named Kelly Weaverling. Have you ever just had a feeling that was just such a strong gut feeling that you just went with your instinct because you just knew it was right? That's what happened. That's exactly what happened. I could do something to give this family hope. The surgery was Wednesday morning, and by Wednesday afternoon, Larry was accosting doctors. You mind? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Everything went perfectly. I love you. Now Larry says he has two new missions, to find other donors for other people and to find a way to properly thank the woman who gave him his wife back. There's not enough words. Larry's struggling for a way to thank you. Just take care of your wife. Just take care of her. Okay. Doubt yeah. that'll be a problem. Oh, I'm fine now. Yeah. Steve Hartman on the road in Charleston, South Carolina. I love you too, baby. 68 years ago today, General Dwight Eisenhower gave the final order for the Allied invasion of Normandy. It was the eve of D-Day. Among the Americans who fought to liberate Europe in the months ahead was First Lieutenant Billy Harris. And that brings us to Steve Hartman's On the Road, part mystery, Heart love story. Peggy Harris of Vernon, Texas, never got a knock at the door, never got a telegram, never got anything definitive explaining what happened to her husband Billy during World War II. And so, in the absence of answers, she has remained dutiful to this day. Billy was married to me all of his life, and I choose to be married to him all of my life. Peggy and Billy got married just six weeks before he got shipped off to war. A fighter pilot, his last mission was July 17, 1944, over Nazi-occupied northern France. 
Billy never returned from that mission. At first, he was reported as missing. Then he was reported as alive and coming home. Then Peggy got a letter saying he'd actually been killed and was buried in one cemetery. Then another letter saying he was buried in a different cemetery. Then she was told maybe those aren't his remains at all. For Peggy, it was very frustrating. And so I waited longer. Months turned to years. And still no answer. Turned to decades. So I wrote to my congressman. Wrote repeatedly, asking for any information about the fate of her husband. The last letter, in 2005, was directed to Representative Mac Thornberry of Texas, who also happens to be vice chairman of the House Armed Services Committee. In his reply, Thornberry said Billy was still listed as missing in action in the National Archives. Didn't feel it was right that he just went off to war and didn't come back. End of story. Billy's cousin, Alton Harvey, grew up with this mystery. You need to know what had happened to him. So, a few years ago, he decided to try and get to the bottom of it for Peggy. He started by requesting Billy's military records, and that's all it took. I said, that can't be. It never dawned on me he was there. Few missing soldiers have ever been easier to find than Billy Harris. Here in Normandy, France, at the world's most famous cemetery, along its most well-traveled path, the answer has been lying all along, clear and sobering as a white marble cross. So why then, as late as 2005, was Peggy's congressman still telling her that her husband was missing in action? Turns out, there are no records of Representative Thornberry ever even checking with the National Archives. And if he had, as we did, he would have seen, it says right there, KIA, killed in action. Thornberry didn't want to talk to us. And for her part, who knows? Peggy harbors no grudge. Have to learn to be forgiving. Mm. She's just glad to finally have an answer. Since learning her husband was buried here, Peggy has been sending flowers. Valentine's Day. Ten times a year she sends flowers. His birthday. Making this, by all accounts, wedding anniversary. The most decorated grave in all of Normandy. Christmas. Cemetery officials say she's also, as far as they know, the last widow who still visits here. After 60 years, she's clearly got a lot of mourning to make up for. When people speak of closure, they are people who haven't experienced anything like this. Acceptance. Peggy says at this point, that's the best she can hope for. And these visits help her get there. Yeah. Plus, she says, after just six weeks together as husband and wife, and more than six decades apart, any time together, is a treasure. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Normandy, France. Peggy has discovered that the people of one French town have loved and honored her husband almost as long as she has. Tomorrow, on the anniversary of D-Day, Steve will take us there. On this anniversary of D-Day, we continue our story of one of the American soldiers who fought to liberate France from the Nazis, First Lieutenant Billy Harris. As we told you last night, it took his widow six decades of battling bureaucracy to learn his fate. But it turns out that his death was just the beginning of an amazing tale. Here again is Steve Hartman with On the Road in Normandy, France. It's now been 67 years since the liberation of France, but at today's D-Day ceremony in Normandy, there was one woman who's still in mourning. In fact, until recently, Peggy Harris of Vernon, Texas, didn't even know her husband Billy was buried here, and certainly didn't know the story I'm about to tell you. Billy was a fighter pilot, shot down and killed in July of 44 over Nazi-occupied northern France. But because of a series of snafus, miscues, and miscommunications, that information never got to his wife. As far as she knew, Billy was just missing. How many years did you wait? All my life. Peggy never remarried, never moved on, and might never have known the whole story if a relative hadn't looked into his military records a few years ago. The surprise wasn't that he died. Peggy had come to assume that. It was what came after. Here in the tiny Normandy town of Levant, the main road is actually called Place Billy D. Harris. It's the same road the townspeople have been marching down three times a year for the past 60 years. 
in part to commemorate his sacrifice. How much does Billy mean to them? Just listen to the mayor's voice when she gets to reading his name on the monument. That's how much. Hello, Peggy. And by extension, that admiration now goes to his wife. So happy to see you again. Since learning her husband crashed near here, Peggy has been making an annual pilgrimage. She visits the nearby woods where the plane went down, escorted by 91-year-old Guy Serlo, the only witness still living. Guy said Billy was able to maintain control of the plane despite his condition and avoid the village. A hero in death. At first, they buried Billy in their local cemetery, covering his grave with flowers knee-deep. Even after his body was moved to the American cemetery at Normandy, the town continued to take flowers to his grave. How can I not be grateful and hold these people very dear? The people of Levant say they just wish they could have done more. If only I was able to help, Guy said. To which Peggy responded, you did. I like to think that he was still conscious enough to know that a friend stood by. <laughs> and that this man was that friend. <laughs> Her gratitude is matched only by theirs. In Levant, the American sacrifice is still very much treasured and honored. So we, we don't forget. They don't forget. And now that we know the story. They don't forget. Neither will we. <laughs> Steve Hartman, on the road in <laughs> Levant, France. A lot of you have called us about Steve Hartman's story this week, about First Lieutenant Billy Harris, a U.S. airman who never came home from World War II, and his widow's quest to learn his fate. As Steve reported, the office of Peggy Harris's congressman, Mac Thornberry of Texas, told her back in 2005 that her husband was still listed as missing in action. But it turns out Lieutenant Harris was not missing at all. He'd been shot down in France in 1944, and he's in the American cemetery in Normandy. Today, on his Facebook page, Congressman Thornberry said he has sent Peggy Harris a personal apology for the mishandling of this sensitive matter and for any distress she has suffered as a result. Steve Hartman's story involves a bride, two men competing for her love, and a turn no one saw coming on the road. For most of her life, 21-year-old Brittany Peck of Elyria, Ohio, felt caught in the middle, torn between two men she truly adored, her father, Todd Bachman, and her stepdad, Todd Sandrosky. I felt like maybe I need to just, like... Pick? Yeah, basically. Yeah. What a position to be in. I know. It was really, really tough. So. I was in kindergarten. This all began back when Brittany was six. Her parents split up, then got wrapped up in a bitter custody battle. It was riddled with lawyers and courtrooms. Her dad, a short-haul truck driver, wanted custody and certainly had no interest in sharing his daughter with Brittany's new stepdad, who says the ill feelings were mutual. We did not get along. We tolerated each other. That's probably the best way to, to describe it. Over the years, things did improve slightly. They shared custody, and both men came to realize they were both pretty good fathers. But there was still a little tension in the air when last month the two families got together for Brittany's wedding. Her biological father was supposed to walk her down the aisle, when all of a sudden he bolted to the front. I said, I'll be back. And that's when I walked down the aisle, grabbed Todd, and said, come on. He said, you had just as much of a part of this in raising these kids as, uh, as I did. He goes, it's, you're going to come and help me walk our daughter down the aisle. Our so, daughter. He said, our daughter. And that's when I lost it. Hand in hand, they went back to get Brittany. Then arm in arm, they gave their daughter the wedding she always dreamed of. It meant the world to me. It was the happiest moment of my life walking down the aisle with both of them. In the presence of God and Parents and step-parents are often at odds, but the wisest eventually realize that getting along isn't just best for the kids, it's best for them. If that individual accepts 
your children and treats them as his own, how can you not have respect for somebody like that? He invited me to be part of that day. And that's something that can never be taken away. Uh, it'll always be there. A little wedding day advice from the fathers of the bride. Steve Hartman on the road in Elyria, Ohio. I won't give away the ending to our final story this week, except to say it is a happy one against all the odds. Here's Steve Hartman on the road. As a drug treatment court judge in Shakopee, Minnesota, the Honorable Chris Wilton has seen some pretty desperate cases. Good afternoon. Thank you. Please be seated. But he says none more desperate than the heroin addict who first appeared before him in the spring of 2014. All right. Welcome. Her name is Jennifer Jensen. You remember when she first came in here? I do. Uh, eight months pregnant and clearly using drugs. That's as bad as it gets. There, there's nobody worse than her. And yet, woeful as she was, a smile still comes to his face at the thought of her. Because today, 24-year-old Jennifer Jensen is clean, 33 months clean, with a healthy son by her side and a wretched past behind. Hooked on heroin by high school, Jennifer posed for more mug shots than yearbook photos. And when she eventually landed in Judge Wilton's courtroom, he somehow saw potential. He took a special interest, stayed on her, made her appear in court more than any other, 27 times total. At first I was like, it's annoying. I have to see this guy this much all the time. Like, I don't want to see this judge all the time. But in hindsight, Jennifer says he saved her life. Yeah, I would not be here at all, probably. That's saying a lot. Mm -hmm. Jennifer's mom, Carrie Martin, says she can't thank that judge enough. Every time I see him, I'm like, you, you saved my, my daughter's life. And he's like, no, I was just the judge. I'm like, no, she looks at you like a father. And that's why, after her final appearance, Jennifer approached the bench with a very special plea. She walked up and asked me if I would perform her marriage. And I was there. There are no quick fixes to America's heroin epidemic. But if there is a lesson in this happy ending, it's that the solution is rooted in tough love and good judges who know when it's time to go heavier on the tough. You're on thin ice. And when it's time to go all in with the love. Steve Hartman on the road in Shakopee, Minnesota. When you think of Valentine's Day, what comes to mind? Roses? Chocolate? How about binoculars? Here's CBS's Steve Hartman on the road. Scott Myers of Detroit, Michigan, and Carolyn Gagne of Windsor, Canada, are in one of the shortest long distance relationships in North America. We could literally wave at one another. Wave at her and she would see me. Scott and Carolyn have been dating a couple years. They used to see each other all the time, but when COVID closed all land border crossings to non-essential travel, this mile wide waterway became an ocean. So what does it take for you to see him? <sighs> there we go. <laughs> right. So I get in my car, drive four and a half hours to the airport in Toronto, got on an airplane, flew literally back to where I had started to surprise him at work. That's how much I love him. <laughs> They've gotten together a few other times, but flights are expensive. So most of their visits are decidedly less intimate. Scott? I'm getting my binoculars out as we speak. This week, they came to the river at our request. I see you! to show just how close but yet so far oh, they are. My eyes are all watery. I know. I miss our normal. You know there are other fish in the Detroit River. So <laughs> you're the 451st person, I believe, that's asked that question in the last year. Um, Scott is my person. Along our borders, there are thousands of couples like Carolyn and Scott, stranded on separate shores, waiting for land crossings to open. And I share their story tonight in hopes that their curse illuminates your blessing. To be stuck at home with the one you love on Valentine's Day sounds pretty perfect to them. And Carolyn says, well worth waiting for. We had a trip planned last March where Scott was going to ask me a very important question. What's your favorite what? color? Exactly. So I'm very much looking forward to Scott and I being able to finally travel where he can ask me in a very romantic manner what my favorite color is. And what will the answer be? Uh, yes. 
and red. <laughs> Steve Hartman. Can you blow me a kiss? CBS News. On the road. I'm waiting for your kiss to make it through immigration right now. We are all ready for this pandemic to be over. We end tonight with a catalytic conversion. Here's Steve Hartman on the road. Come on. All cattlemen face challenges beyond their control. But not long ago, at this ranch south of Houston, Tommy Sonnen faced a problem of his own I doing. You know, every marriage has its issues. It's uh, not always easy. I was as unprepared for it as anybody. What's that? It all began innocently enough. Want to come lay down? Shortly after they got married six years ago, Renee just started hanging out with the livestock. Okay, baby. Tommy warned her. Renee, don't name those cows. But she didn't listen. Hey, Star. Then she started singing to them, too. Who's going next in the red trailer? And before long, this rancher's wife had turned into a rancher's worst nightmare. A vegan who couldn't stomach so much as living on a cattle ranch anymore. Well, he was just going to get out of the business, and our marriage was going to be over. It wasn't working. And uh, I said, I'm going to sell the whole herd. And she goes, well, if you're going to sell the whole herd anyway, why don't you just sell them to me? I said, sell them to you. And he looks at me like, you have lost it. You are crazy. Clearly, there was some truth to that. But what Tommy didn't know was that Renee had been secretly posting a blog called Vegan Journal of a Rancher's Wife. She attracted thousands of followers, and through those contacts, Renee was able to raise $30,000, enough for a hostile takeover. All of a sudden, he was fixing to be bought out by his wife. Is this not emasculating in any way? No! I'm asking him. Yeah, I, I didn't appreciate it, but, uh... You know, it was growing pains. Come here. And here's where this story gets good. After his wife raised the money, Tommy did something rare for a rancher, or any man for that matter. He put aside his ego and reconsidered a core belief. How are you doing, girl? He stopped eating meat, liked how it felt, and now works for his wife at the Rowdy Girl Vegan Farm Animal Sanctuary. As best we can tell, the only cattle ranch conversion in the country. So now that he's changed for you, how would you like to change her? I can't think of a thing. Aw. <laughs> and there is everything you need to know to stay married forever. <laughs> Steve Hartman on the road in Angleton, Texas. <laughs> and that's the CBS Evening News for tonight. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, the time is always right to do what is right. Tonight, Steve Hartman is on the road with school kids who decided the time was right to right a wrong. At the Mount Airy Resort in the Poconos of Pennsylvania, Reverend Gilbert Caldwell and his wife Grace are arriving for their we're second here. honeymoon. We're here, we're here, we're here. They were greeted warmly. Well, how are you? A sharp contrast to their first visit 60 years earlier. In 1957, they were married in North Carolina then drove eight hours only to be turned back for being black. How did they put it? Did they give you a reason? First, they pretended I didn't have a reservation where I actually brought a copy. And then, of course, they said, but if we said yes, our guests would be very unhappy. They had to stay at a black-owned hunting lodge instead. Men with these big guns. <laughs> Not what you were planning on for your honeymoon? <laughs> Not what we were planning on. <laughs> Prodded partly by that experience, Gil immersed himself in the civil rights movement, working side by side with Martin Luther King Jr. Today, he speaks about the movement, which is how he ended up at Bear Tavern Elementary in Titusville, New Jersey last year. He told the honeymoon story, as he'd done a hundred times before. But for whatever reason, this group of fifth graders really took it to heart. At the end of the story, I was like, that's just terrible. It was really heartbreaking. Just because it's just so wrong. I feel like this is the worst thing that someone could do to someone even months after the Caldwell's visit. Kids like Emily Eshelman are still this affected. You feel bad for them that they had to go through that? A ton. A ton? Yeah. Which is why each fifth grader wrote a letter to Mount Airy. One said, the Caldwell's made me think about not only standing up for myself, 
but standing up for others and fixing mistakes that were made in the world. In closing, the kids requested an all-expense-paid honeymoon redo, which they got. It makes me feel really good inside because we know that even though we're just kids, we made an impact on the world. It was really magnificent to know that kids cared that much. Oh, the rug feels so nice. I should mention that the original Mount Airy was torn down years ago. What a beautiful place. This is a new building with new owners who were just so impressed with the kids, they wanted to help make it right. Maybe was this worth waiting 60 years for? Obviously, this does not make up for decades of racial injustice, but it's a step and a sign that we can get there. Steve Hartman, on the road, in the Poconos. Finally tonight, what's the secret to a happy marriage? One couple found theirs sitting in a cupboard. Here's Steve Hartman, on the road. Brandon and Kathy Gunn of Northville, Michigan, have been married nine years now, and yet they just recently opened their last wedding present. It was by far the greatest gift because it taught us so many lessons about how to be married. The present was from Kathy's great aunt Allison, and it came with a card that read, do not open until first disagreement. I'm breaking case of emergency. I hope this works. They say they needed it many times, but never opened it. You kind of wonder, you know, is it time to turn to the box? Should we open the box? Do we need it right now? But well, what if the next spat is worse and we didn't have the box, then what? So it sat on the top shelf of the kitchen pantry. Through all the arguments about dishes left undone, through stress and slamming doors, even when they thought it wasn't worth it anymore, Brandon and Kathy refused to surrender to that last wedding present. They finally opened the gift just recently, not because they were fighting, but because they weren't and hadn't for quite some time. After nine years of successfully resolving their differences, Brandon and Kathy were confident they would never really need the contents. What they found was remarkably unremarkable. Some money for flowers and wine, some bath salts, nothing that could really stop a fight at all. And that's when it hit them, that the real gift wasn't anything in the box. On, buddy. That the real gift, the priceless gift, had been staring at them all along. Everything we needed, we had between us. We just had to figure it out on our own. <laughs> By not turning to the box, Brandon and Kathy say they were forced to learn tolerance, compromise, and patience. Something we could all use more of this week. Because there's nothing magical about wedding gifts or ballot boxes. The keys to harmony are in us. All we have to do is dig deep and find them. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Northville, Michigan. The 9-11 Memorial and Museum here at Ground Zero will ensure that future generations learn about the attacks. But it might not exist were it not for one determined woman. Here's CBS's Steve Hartman on the road. After 20 years in a box, Monica Eichen is ironing her wedding dress, getting ready to wear it once more. And although she will wipe away every wrinkle, she will not smooth over the tragedy it represents. I think wearing the dress makes a statement. What is the statement? That I was happily married the day he died. And I was looking forward to having a family. Monica was married just 11 months when her husband Michael, a bond trader, died in Tower 2. It was a brief marriage, but Monica says the loss feels everlasting. There is no moving on. You never move on from it. You move in. You move into the life that was chosen for you. Hi, my name is Monica Eichen, founder of September's Mission. When I first met Monica, just four months after 9-11, she'd already moved into that new life. We will fight. Advocating for a memorial on the site of the towers and warning that any other use of the land would be unacceptable. You're going to stand down there. Absolutely. In front of the bulldozers and not let them put up a building. Right. We don't build over crying souls. She was tenacious. Relentless. George Pataki, New York governor at the time, says it's important to remember that a lot of people didn't think we needed a memorial here. People who just said we had to move on, just rebuild. But Monica said this was hallowed ground. Was there a louder voice than hers? 
<laughs> a lot of people deserve credit for that, but certainly Monica Eichen is among the most. Monica has since remarried and has a family, but she freely admits and has come to accept that she will always be in love with two men. We can live our lives, but still keep that memory. Moving in, but never moving on. Her motto and her vision for this most sacred space. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in New York. We end with a sweet and tender southern barbecue experience. Steve Hartman serves it up on the road. For barbecue lovers, Brad's Barbecue in Oxford, Alabama is heaven on earth. But 80-year-old Eleanor Baker says her visit here earlier this month was especially divine. I think it was a God thing. I think God sent me there. You think we needed the example? Yes, that people care about other people and how important it is. <laughs> Eleanor is a widow. She lives with her dog, Rufus. And although she has a big family, they mostly live out of town. So Eleanor was alone the night she went to Brad's barbecue. Security footage shows her entering there in the purple. And at about that same time, these three young men arrived. They say they were just having a good old time. We was all just sitting there just talking. When Jamario Howard noticed Eleanor. An older woman sitting by herself. Jamario says he hates seeing people eat alone. And I seen that. When most of us see someone eating alone, we feel that way. But our sympathy never solves anything. And Jamario really wanted to fix this. So he got up from his table and sat at hers. He just came up and he said, I saw you sitting over here alone. And he said, do you mind having some company? And she said, go right ahead. And then I introduced myself and she introduced herself. And that's just kind of how it all got started. They all ended up having dinner together. And it was just a really nice, pleasant evening. <laughs> what those 20-somethings did that night speaks volumes about their character. Man. But they say it wasn't entirely altruistic. <laughs> they enjoyed her company as much as she enjoyed right. theirs. Because when we left there, that's all we talked about. When you make that kind of connection with somebody, it's hard to let it go. Like I already feel like we're her grandkids. <laughs> so you got room for these guys in your life? Of course. I'm so glad y'all could make it. They have all vowed to make room for one another. And certainly, if Eleanor's right, that God played any role in this, it may be to remind us of the joy that awaits just outside the bubbles we live in. I used to say when I was younger, and I still say today, like, I'm going to change the world somehow. And I don't know how, because I'm not rich, I'm not famous, and I'm not very smart either, so I can't be the president. But we can show the world that it's all right to be kind, and then before long, maybe the world will be a much better place. <laughs> Amen. Steve Hartman on the road in Oxford, Alabama. Finally tonight, CBS's Steve Hartman goes on the road to revisit a touching story of true love that blossomed in sickness and in health. Oh my gosh, let's find the picture. Peter and Lisa Marshall of Andover, Connecticut are paging through the most memorable day of their lives. It was unforgettable. But he's forgotten it. He has forgotten it. Who's this? It's the saddest part mm. because you want to reminisce and you're alone in the memory. Red Wing Blackbird. As we first reported a couple years ago, Peter was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. Eventually, he not only forgot his wedding day. He's pretty, isn't he? He forgot his wife. Lisa became just another nameless caretaker. And yet, a whisper of their love must have remained, because Lisa says all of a sudden, he began courting her, as if they'd just started dating. Until one day, a wedding scene came on TV. Peter pointed to the screen and said, let's do it. And I said, do what? And he pointed at the, he pointed again. And I said, you want to get married? And he got this grin on his face. And he said, yeah. So he fell in love with me again. <laughs> Lisa accepted his proposal and staged a wedding for her already husband. I can't even describe to you how magical it was. He was so <laughs> present and it was very touching. Peter, you may kiss your bride. Lisa says Peter hadn't been this lucid in weeks. <laughs> but it was a Cinderella moment. 
the clock struck 12, and by the next morning, this wedding too was lost to the fog. Yes. But Lisa says she fully expected that. I'm the one who's gonna remember that, and that's gonna help me heal later. Unfortunately, later came. Peter died about a year ago. Lisa is now advocating for other Alzheimer's patients and their families. She has also written a book called, Oh, Hello, Alzheimer's. I wanted people to understand the devastation of the disease, but mostly I want people to continue to find joy and really focus on, the, on being present with their loved ones. Do that, and Lisa says Alzheimer's will never defeat you. It'll just make your love all the more invincible. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Andover, Connecticut. There are always a lot of people to thank on a wedding day, but the bride-to-be at this church outside Chicago had one person to thank over all others, a total stranger who made this possible. I wouldn't have been here if it wasn't for him. A couple years ago, out of the blue, 27-year-old Heather Kruger was diagnosed with stage four liver disease. Doctors said she had just a few months to live. I mean, they immediately told me I was gonna need a transplant. That's not enough time to really find a donor, right? No. By that time, I could really feel my body shutting down. Enter our hero. Chris Dempsey is a code enforcement officer for the village of Frankfurt, Illinois. What's going on? And he says he was in the break room one day when he overheard a guy talking about this woman who needed a liver donor. I spent four years in the Marine Corps and learned there never to run away from anything. So I just said to myself, hey, if I can help, I'm going to help. Keep in mind, he'd never met Heather, but he got tested to see if he was compatible. And when he found out he was, that's when they finally met for the first time. We had lunch together, discussed what the whole process was going to be. Did you buy at least? No, he bought. Oh my gosh, <laughs> this guy's amazing. <laughs> yeah, he bought, yeah. I remember. <laughs> Not long after, they checked into the University of Illinois Hospital. The transplant, which involves removing about half of the donor's liver, went off without a hitch. Afterward, Chris and Heather remained close. They got so close, in fact, he was at her wedding last weekend. He had to be, really. I mean, what's a wedding without a groom? And so it was that a year and a half after giving her part of his liver, she gave him all her heart. You're the most incredible man I've ever known. You believe in me, and you make me feel amazing every single day. Because of you, I laugh, smile, and I dare to dream again. Acts of great kindness are done without expectation. When Chris decided to give an organ to a random stranger, he had no idea he was saving his own wife. But such is the way of goodness. The more likely you are to live for others, the more likely you are to live happily ever after. Steve Hartman on the road in Frankfort, Illinois. We end the week with Steve Hartman and a young man's quest to travel back in time on the road. Whoa. Even in Texas, a horse only gets you so far, which is why 15-year-old Justin Rozier has been thinking lately about a car. Specifically, he told his mom, Jessica, he would love to have a car, any car, that his dad once owned. Whoa. I mean, it could have been a 1974 Dodge Astro. I don't even know if that's a car, but he, it could have been anything and he would have said yes. Why? I know that he wishes his dad was here. In 2003, Justin's dad, Army First Lieutenant Jonathan Rozier, died in Iraq. Justin was nine months old. Today, he cherishes anything that used to belong to his dad which is why he thought it would be so cool to have his car. I don't know, like just knowing that, it that he had it, it's a whole lot different than just any other thing, really. Unfortunately, yeah. after John died, Jessica had to sell the car, a 99 Toyota Celica convertible like this one. Finding it again would be nearly impossible, but Jessica said she had to at least try. I feel like this is something that would, would connect him but this is a needle in a haystack. Well, I've seen magical things happen on Facebook. 
So she turned to Facebook, posted the old VIN number with a note asking for help. And somehow, that message made it all the way to Pleasant Grove, Utah, where local residents not only found the car. We decided, you know, let's, let's see if we can buy the car. This is Kyle Fox. Now, I'm not saying so I'm he's a saint, to but... Like that, to serve and, um, well, and that butterfly right. stayed there for half an hour. <laughs> no, I don't even know where I was in that. <laughs> anyway, Kyle, who runs a nonprofit called Follow the Flag, got donations to purchase the car and then assembled a team of volunteer mechanics to fix it like new. All of this unbeknownst to Justin until this very moment. Last month, Kyle drove the car from Utah to surprise Justin for his 15th birthday. Go see it. I can't tell you what this meant to Justin. I mean, I really can't. He tried to explain it to me, but when he opened his mouth, no words fell out. It's a link to the past for him. Yeah. It's a big thing for me, too. I never got to see him come home. So that just one moment right there was, I think I needed that. <laughs> Obviously. This was never about a car. No, this was about trying to push past what you can't forget. Trying to remember what you never knew. All with the help of a country so grateful and kind, you can't imagine. I'm so glad we could do this for you. Steve Hartman, on the road, in Moore, Texas. Here's a question. Can you call it young love when two sweethearts are well into their golden years? Well, don't answer that until you hear from CBS's Steve Hartman tonight on the road. For 95-year-old John Schultz, right here. the best thing to come out of this pandemic okay. is coming down the aisle. John's brand new bride, Joy Morrow Knowlton, is also 95. And together they're proving you're never too old Hold hands. to make a lifetime commitment. Until death do us part. We first met John and Joy in March, parked along the banks of the Hudson River in Kingston, New York. Parked in the slang sense. Wait a minute, get your glasses up. Fortunately, their PDA That's it. is mostly <laughs> for the week. LOL. He's a lot of baloney. <laughs> John and Joy were each widowed twice, but determined to find love again, which wasn't easy. Before getting vaccinated, they had to do most of their dating in a bubble. She was worth it. It was a pain in the neck, though. <laughs> Perseverance. Pete Schultz is John's son. They would call every day. Um, they'd find a way to get together, but they did whatever it took. You haven't held hands with me all day, by the way. Hold my hand. What it took, they say, was a return to simple pleasures, like long drives to nowhere, batting balloons around the house, and a whole lot of selflessness. She bought me a walker. She bought you a walker? $159, I think. Whoa. I told you she had money. <laughs> she did have it, so she bought my walker. <laughs> Not to be outdone, John bought her a little something, too. I declare you husband and wife. <laughs> For many of us, June weddings will mark a reemergence. You may kiss your bride. A bright bloom after a dark winter and a proclamation that young love is officially out of lockdown. Steve Hartman on the road near Kingston, New York. And we wish them all the best. Finally tonight, Frank Sinatra told us love is lovelier the second time around. Steve Hartman found proof on the road. Lori Agan of Bowling Green, Ohio, is about to marry her soulmate. But getting to this moment was not easy. After her first marriage ended in a bitter divorce, Lori says she could have never imagined this. It's a miracle that this happened. This doesn't happen every day that people get a second chance at true love. Her first chance ended so badly, she relegated her memories of it to a closet floor. Their eight wonderful children aside, Lori says at the end, she and her ex-husband just did not mesh. The fighting, what the kids were witnessing, I just didn't want in our lives anymore. The kids say it was that bad. Then, I mean, the tension in the house, you could cut it like a knife. 
We blamed ourselves. We thought that it was because of us. The whole family was an absolute wreck. But in the wake of the divorce, Lori decided to fix the only person she could, herself. She worked hard to build up her self-esteem and got treatment for depression. Meanwhile, across town, her ex-husband Jeff was going through his own reckoning. He sought treatment for alcoholism and turned his life around. And all this self-improvement had an unintended consequence. Eventually, they could actually tolerate being in the same room at the same time. They didn't have to have two separate birthday parties for each kid. And last year, they even spent Christmas together. Still, not even the children knew how close they'd become until Lori got her present from Jeff. It was a love poem that ended with a familiar ring. Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh yes, yes! Lori had found her soulmate again. Oh my God, I love you. There are no words to express what I felt at that moment. Last month, four years after their breakup, Lori and Jeff got married. They called it a family healing ceremony, and heal it did. I was just so happy for my parents. Especially the children. It's just they both come so far. I'm just so proud of them. We get a do-over. Who gets a do-overs in this world? We got a do-over. The big thing I would add to that is don't be too proud to get help because some jobs are too big for you to do by yourself. Can I hug him? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All that we went through. Sometimes we think love is lost when really it's just misplaced and waiting to be found. Steve Hartman on the road in Bowling Green, Ohio. That is the best. We end the week with a story of undying love told by Steve Hartman on the road. Six days a week for years, retired mechanic Clarence Purvis had lunch with his wife at this restaurant in Reedsville, Georgia. But we're here today because he still does. Although Carolyn died four years ago, she remains his lunch date. She's a perfect wife if ever been one. Ain't nobody loved one another more than we loved one another. Everybody said that. They were unbelievable. I mean, you could tell that they adored each other. 972. That's why restaurant owner Joyce James says she wasn't surprised in the least when Clarence started showing up with the picture, which is really just a small part of his all-day devotion. Each morning begins with a trip to the cemetery. Hey, baby, I'm back again. Where, at the ripe old age of 93, Clarence gets down on bended knee to give his wife her morning kiss. Maybe I wish you could go home with me. If you're not, I'd trade places with you, Lord, we will, wouldn't we? Before the sun sets, he will be back here again at least four more times. I'll be back. Just to check on her. This her here? In between visits, he basks in the memories of their 64-year marriage. Oh, you got posters. His house, like a monument to their love, complete with an eternal flame of sorts. And that light was turned on. It ain't never been turned off. It never will be. Outside of the Taj Mahal, you won't find a more convincing testament to true love than this home. Outside of a Shakespeare sonnet, you won't find a more eloquent love poem than her picture on her pillow. I can't figure out if this is a really sad story or a really happy story. It's a happy story. Tell me why. How many people in this world have that much love this day and time? You know? She was sweet and still sweet. I had to agree with Joyce. He is happiest when he's talking to her or about her. I'm gonna give you something. Which is why if you can't make it to the shrine, he'll bring the shrine to you. It never been turned off since my wife died. Y'all keep that, okay? Today, there's not a resident in Reedsville who hasn't been offered a picture of the lamp or the tombstone. We had a good life. Not a passerby who doesn't know what they missed. Ain't, ain't no other girl for me but her. Obviously. No one ever wants to suffer a loss like his. But Clarence Purvis does offer us something to strive for, the ability to love this deeply. Steve Hartman on the road in Reedsville, Georgia. Finally tonight, an army widow makes good on a long-kept promise. CBS's Steve Hartman has her inspiring story 
on the road. It's karaoke night inside the Sigma Kappa sorority house at Bowling Green State University in Ohio. And here, amongst all the dancing queens in their teens, we found one stationary sister in her 40s. Tiffany Eckert, America's most unlikely sorority sister, in so many more ways than one. I still miss you every day. Tiffany's husband, Andy Eckert, died in the Iraq War. This is his wedding ring. Years later, I did a story on their son, Miles, the little boy who found a $20 bill in a Cracker Barrel parking lot and then gave it away to an airman he saw in the restaurant. Because he was a soldier, and soldiers remind me of my dad. Miles' tribute to his father deeply touched the nation. But there was another story here, one that has gone untold till now. Yeah, just a few hours before my husband was killed, he called home from Iraq and he said, no matter how long it took, I had to get an education and he made me promise that I would. And then he told me, I love you more than anything in this world. I'll call you tomorrow. It was the last promise she ever made to him and the only one she hadn't kept. Tiffany says she barely made it through high school and now had little kids to raise on her own. College was out of the question. But those kids grew up. So three years ago, she decided to not only enroll, but to immerse herself in the full college experience. You can't focus on the negative because you'll always be in the pit. It's easier to claw your way up when you're reaching for the sunshine. That's how you get out of the hole. You know, she's helped me so much and she's inspired me a lot. And I know she's inspired a lot of the other girls in the chapter. There's definitely not one person she hasn't made an impact on. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Including, Tiffany hopes, the most important person. I go back to that last phone call and uh, I think he's really, really proud of me. She graduates next month. Love you. Promise kept. Steve Hartman on the road in Bowling Green, Ohio. We end tonight with a detective who didn't have a clue what was missing until he found it. Here's Steve Hartman on the road. Generally speaking, if you're a kid growing up in Pittsburgh, like Jesse and Josh Lyle, the last place you ever want to be is in a courtroom across the table from Detective Jack Mook. How do? Mook is a by the book, no nonsense, chew him up, spit him out, 22 year veteran of the force. Outside of work, he's a committed bachelor, a man's man, who would never so much as let a Vidalia see his soft side. For fun, he hits people and volunteers at the Steel City Boxing Gym, Flip. teaching the sport to underprivileged kids. To Most of the kids that come in this gym are street kids. I'm not going to hurt you. And many of them have been uh, born into poverty. Kids like Jesse and his older brother, Josh. Long before their date in court, Jack had been working with them. Turn that hand. He really liked these kids Set. and knew the feeling was mutual. Turn that hand. So when they just stopped showing up at the gym one day, jab, jab. Jack went out right and hand. found them. And he was asking me about it, and then I just cried. What Jack didn't know, what no one knew till that moment, was just how bad these kids had it. They were in a foster home with foster parents who Jack says were extremely abusive and neglectful. They have had it as worse as any other kid that's ever lived in the city of Pittsburgh, living conditions wise. Really? And that just, I had enough of it. So Jack Mook took matters into his own hands, cashed in some favors and got the kids placed in a new home. You want something else to eat? his. For Jack, it's been quite an adjustment. I'm in here trying to learn my culinary skills, brother. But I get the sense that you're really loving this. Yeah, yes. It's awesome. It's the best thing I ever did in my life. At least it was the best thing. That's it. Until the day he went to court and did one better. They'll be successful. Adopted the boys. All right, come on, guys. And made them mooks. You're mook, right? You happy? After this story first aired in 2014, we got a lot of email, a surprising amount from women who wanted to meet this guy. 
So did you email us? Are you one of those? No, <laughs> no. Mary says she saw the story, but she met him in a bar. Did you go to the bar because you knew he'd be there? Yes. Ah, <laughs> yes. I am For answering all America honestly. To see. <laughs> they were married last summer. She came with three of her own, so now Jack and the boys are part of a Brady Bunch, a family none of them could have ever imagined just a few years ago. Jack especially. I thought being single was fun because you don't have no responsibilities. But when you're single, you don't realize what you're missing. I'm glad I let her break through that barrier and take me away from that life. Sounds like it wasn't just the boys who were rescued. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Pittsburgh.